direct from Foxborough, Massachusetts, the gem of Norfolk County, and taped at the studios of Foxborough Cable Access. It's Foxborough Central, and here's your host, Bob Hickey. Welcome again to another great episode of Foxborough Central. You heard the man, I'm Bob Hickey, your host. Thank you for taking a little bit of time to sit with me, have a cup of coffee as we learn about the people, events, and organizations that make Foxborough the gem of Norfolk County. Joining me today are a cast of many, but before we get to that, I'd like to read something out of a recent Foxborough reporter story. And this is about John and Julie Hazeldine and the issues they're going through with keeping the family homestead. Julianne Hazeldine says she cannot adequately express her gratitude for the outpouring of neighborly concern over her and disabled husband John's looming eviction from their Spring Street home. As of Tuesday, less than a week after members of the community set up a fund to help the couple try to stay in their home, 122 individuals or organizations contributed a total of $20,000. $660. For now, the couple are hoping to convince the Needham Bank, which bought the house in September 11th foreclosure auction, to give them an extension from their February 13th deadline to vacate the premises. Formerly an 11-acre farm, the house has been in Hazeldine's family since the 1920s. John spent most of his childhood there and had been caring for a retired horse and other adopted animals at the home following his disabling stroke in 2008. The stroke, which paralyzed his left arm and affected his left leg, forced him to retire from his work as Foxborough's animal control officer. Julia works full-time. Family friend Charles DePompo Wednesday said it's his belief that the Office of Attorney General Martha Coakley is trying to help the Hazeldines obtain a delay in their eviction next week from direct federal credit union while the couple tries to qualify for financing from another lender. Contributions to John and Julie Hazeldine should be payable to the Friends of Foxborough Seniors Post Office Box 116, Foxborough, Mass, 02035. Please write on the check or include a note that the donation is for the Hazeldines. Because the Friends are a registered charity, the donations are tax deductible. So that's what's been in the news. John and Julie Hazeldine have had foreclosure on their home and are at a last ditch effort to try to save it. A fund's been set up by Charles DePompo and also John's uh, childhood friend, Bill Milholm. So joining me today are Charles, Bill, and a couple of other folks. And what we'd like to do is in addition to raising funds and bringing light to the plight of John and Julie Hazeldine, and I do hope that you at home will consider if you have the ability to make a donation to John and Julie to the Foxborough Senior Center, um, uh, to the Fo Friends of Foxborough Seniors. Uh, this is more of a discussion of how we as a community uh, understand their issue and how we as individuals can avoid having the same issue. And before we even start, John and Julie give their blessing to this program. This is meant to be educational and a good discussion. So, that said, joining me today are Bill Milholm. Thank you very much. And I'm not going to do the handshake. I usually do all the way around the table just because I can't reach you and I don't want to knock over my coffee. <laughs> also joining us, in addition to Bill Milholm, uh, who's one of the two people who have really taken the lead in this uh, fundraising effort is Mike Johns, who is our Veterans Affairs Officer uh, and uh, speaking with us today because um, veterans uh, often face this uh, as part of their post-service life. Uh, there's uh, different uh, traumatic issues that can happen and certainly uh, financial issues, uh, inability to hold a job, um, inability to reacclimate may also play into issues such as foreclosure and being homeless. Mark Stopa, who is our noted local attorney, who, uh, in, in my opinion, is an expert on the topic and who will hopefully be able to share with us some of the uh, preventative measures, steps along the way that we can take to avoid the final last gasp effort that we're facing here with John and Julie. And of course, Giles DePapa, who I spoke with and was first turned on to this story with, thank you so much for joining us and for organizing this whole thing. So, nice to be here. let's start off with you, Charles. Uh, where are we at with the fundraising? Um, I think with the fundraising, it's like each day, it's getting better and better because the community is, is really um, being so generous to help John and Julie out. And um, I know Bill has the, you do have the update, Bill, on the, uh, what the latest is? Um, well, before the storm, I believe we uh, have raised uh, $25,660. We have uh, 152 donors as of, uh, as of Thursday morning. So we're hoping today, now that the bank might be opened, we would have an update on that. And we pray that it'd be up to about 30,000, maybe 200 donors. 
That's fantastic. And for those of you at home, uh, as of this taping, uh, the uh, foreclosure hadn't happened yet, and this week that this is uh, airing uh, is a real key uh, critical uh, tipping point of the fundraising and of the Hazeldine's ability to convince a bank that they do have uh, financial backing to uh, make a play, if you will. So. Um, it's very important, it's very timely that uh, we all participate now to the best of our ability. So with John and Julie doing this, uh, I mean, it's got to be a big uh, step on their part to make it public, and the Fox Report has done a great job of covering it. Um, but what is your sense of, of the feelings at home at, at the Hazeldine House? Are they hopeful? Or are they? Um, well, I, I would really like to defer that to uh, Charles, because Charles actually is working with them uh, at their home, and I think he could probably respond to that question a little bit better. I know they're just, they're just overwhelmed by the outpouring of, of, of help and, and love that the community of Foxborough and surrounding communities are giving them and the letters that are being sent with the checks and, and just reading them. Uh, I know that uh, Julie is, and John are very pleased and happy about that. But also, um, Julie said, I asked Julie, is there anything else that, that this whole bad experience in terms of what's happened up until recently, which has turned into a good experience for them, is there anything you'd want to say? And all she told me was, get help, get help, get help. And I, I, just so that other people in the community don't go through the, it had to be a horrendous process that they went through in terms of all the stress and uh, mm -hmm. not knowing if they were going to lose their home or not or whether there was going to be the uh, actual auction sale. And, and in fact, Julie said right up until the very end, she didn't think the auction sale was going to go forward, and it, it did. And that, that's an interesting point because, uh, and the Fox report again has done an excellent job of reporting uh, on their plight. And the auction sale, when it happened, my understanding is that uh, it was publicized, um, but they didn't really believe it was going to go forward. So, Mark Stope, I'm going to toss this out to you as our uh, attorney reference. What are the steps that a bank has to go through? What should they go through? And how did this happen? Well, I think more important than understanding the steps that the bank has to go through, and I'll deal with that in a second, I think the, the primary thing is taking on something that you just, or taking off with something you just said, is early intervention. People get into these problems not by accident. It's a slow process. Uh, maybe somebody gets laid off. Maybe somebody gets injured. All of a sudden, the income level drops. Now you have to make decisions every month. Who gets paid and who doesn't get paid? And then you get notices from the bank, and they're, you know, they're threatening you. Well, we, we've all seen letters that have come out from you know, credit agencies and, and banks and the like, and they seem to threaten, but it seem, it's, a, you know, it's a robo letter. It's just spit out by a computer and sent. So people tend to become numb to that, and then they don't read them, mm -hmm. and then they don't open them. And you know they see it come in the in the uh, the mail, and it either goes into a pile or it goes into the fireplace, or it just gets recycled. And important information comes out in those letters. So it's not just a pass due bill; it's really a legal notice of sorts to them that in, they need to pay attention. Indeed. To. And then when when certified mail starts to show up, people just assume, oh, it's that they just want to make sure I got that other letter. And they couldn't be more wrong. The the opportunity to fix these problems is there. Mm -hmm. uh, banks don't want to own homes. They, they, they want their customers to be in their homes, they want their bills to be paid and so forth, but you have to give them a viable solution. And the only way to really work that out is to have very early intervention in the process. Uh, as we were discussing off camera, I, I've handled everything from the person who just missed their second mortgage payment to people who came to me at 2.15 in the afternoon the day before foreclosure mm. to try to get the foreclosure sale stopped. So. Oh. It, the 2.15 in the afternoon the day before, not so good. <laughs> uh, fortunately for, for those clients, I was able to do that. Mm -hmm. and, but that was almost a bit of a miracle that we were able to engineer that. We got all the right people on the phone, got all the right documents in, and we were able to do that. I, I don't choose to want to have to do that ever again because it was just an unbelievable effort. Mm -hmm. uh, but contacting the lenders early, trying to work out either a modification of the loan or just some other term. There are lots and lots of possibilities. I don't want to, by my comments, limit things unnecessarily. There are a lot of options out there. There are options with the lender. There are op options with the Attorney General's office. And, and there are federal programs. And people hear about them because they see the the advertisements on television and so Heart forth. Loans. Yeah, but you know they give a little information, but they don't give a lot, enough information. Mm -hmm. and, and there's one cautionary thing I want to add in there, is we, there are also predators out there. There are people who open up these businesses who pretend 
to give you a solution for how you can pay off your bills and, and you, all you have to do is pay them a certain amount of money and they'll do that for you. And I've had clients that have gone to those kinds of services and to be sure, there are probably some that are good, mm -hmm. but there are many that are not. And I've, I've sat down with clients and gone through the list and say, well, let's just take a look at how much they're asking for from you. Mm -hmm. This is how much they say they're going to save you. If we add it all up, you're actually spending three or $4,000 more than what you owe. Where's the benefit there? So you have to be, you have to be a, a, uh, a cautious consumer. You have, to, you have to apply some intelligence to you this. You know, it's interesting that you say that because, and, and Mike, with the, um, uh, we had had an earlier discussion on another episode of Fox vs. Central about uh, scams and about uh, phone solicitations. Uh, I myself uh, have recently uh, gone through a refinance. And in doing it, we, even before we thought about doing it, we were receiving solicitations through the mail, um, one, two a day, about new TARP program, refinance, and was not really interested at the time of, of pursuing it, but then started doing some research and looking at, okay, who sent this letter and looking them up, and nothing more or less, and I'm no expert, but Googling the names and finding out that they're you know, less than reputable. Some of them are flagged by the Better Business, Better Business Bureau. And in, in looking at that, and as you say, I'm sure there's some very quality ones, but the buyer does have to be aware. And we were talking about scams and fraud. Veteran services, do you see this also with uh, companies that target veterans with uh, refinancing plans or promises or needs or pretend needs? Absolutely, but where there's a need, um, there's also a predator out there waiting to jump on that need and capitalize. Um, so, so you know, in my field, a lot of times it's you know uh, veterans' claims, but also in in home loans, somebody starts defaulting, somebody gets behind, and it seems like the predators often are quicker mm -hmm. than anyone else to uh, reach out and aggressively lend a hand. So, again, uh, buyer beware. I agree with uh, with what Mark has said. Let me get back to your question on, on the process with the bank. And I, sure. I won't go through all the detail, but they have to, they've actually got to give you notice of everything. So there should be no surprises. Uh, that two o'clock in the afternoon uh, situation was largely because one of the spouses decided to keep the information from the other until it was day before, and it was, oh no. You know, it's all going to come crashing in. I better say something now. Yes. And, and that caused them to come into the office. But they have to give you notice along the way. They've got to file. They've got to give notice. They have to uh, uh, certify to the court that you're not in the service because if you're deployed in the service, they can't do this. Mm -hmm. the, the federal laws are protect against that. So the, the, there are notices all along the way. And every time there's a notice, it's, it, it escalates the problem. And I, I, as I said earlier, you want to get into this early. It's not going to fix itself. They are not going to go away. They want a solution. Mm -hmm. And it, every bank is different. Every situation is different. But there are usually solutions out there. And, and presumably the bank wants their money in full. And by going to the step, going to auction, they're taking a loss also. They're looking to essentially close out a liability, if, for lack of a better term. Oh, absolutely so. But they're also learning that they don't want to own homes because it's very expensive. In the beginning, I, I, I imagine for the banks, it was very enticing. Oh, we're going to own all these properties. Well, they're all now vacant, deteriorating properties. And, and if you look at the situation, not so much for Foxborough, but in a city where they own hundreds of them, if not thousands of, of the homes that are all deteriorating, mm -hmm. the cities started pushing back saying, well, hey, listen, you were so hot to trot to, to own this building, take care of the building, right. secure the building. It's otherwise becoming a blight and there's squatters and all those other kinds of things that can happen. And there's been a lot of that in the news, uh, particularly the uh, city of Rockton has been yes. going after folks. Yes, absolutely. Yep. So with this situation in particular, Charles, uh, the, um, the steps along the way, and, and going back to the very beginning, um, John becoming disabled. And again, uh, for folks at home, uh, we're doing this program with the blessing of John and Julie. Uh, we certainly don't want to breach anybody's privacy, but at the same time, this is such a compelling story and one I think we as a community are embracing because we want to help them uh, stay in their home. We want to raise funds. And again, I'll put the plug out there. Uh, <laughs> if you'd like to help uh, John and Julie Hazeldine with their, um, with their need right now to uh, raise money, uh, please contact uh, either Charles DePompa, we'll give some phone numbers and contact information at the end of the program, 
Um, but you can also send a check to the Friends of the Foxborough Seniors at Post Office Box 116 here in Foxborough and just annotate on the check that it's for John and Julie. And I guess if they write a letter, uh, that, sounds like Julie's getting all the letters. That, John and Julie have gotten some of those letters already, and I think it made the blizzard a little easier. <laughs> and, um, um, and again, you know, they appreciate that. They mm -hmm. really do. And could I just add one thing that Mark said, which I think is really critical, and that's Absolutely. in terms of the, the paper trail, the, the paper, the letters that come to the people that might be having problems, not just John and Julie in their case. What John and Julie did, fortunately, everything that came into their home, they kept it. Mm -hmm. They may not have understood totally how all the pieces fit together, but they kept all that information. And that was really critical because um, there are places for help, whether it's the federal government or the attorney general's office or or, uh, or government agencies, but the critical thing is to, is to have that paper trail. And um, when you go to seek help, if you have that paper trail with you, uh, it's gonna make, a, make getting help a lot easier. And what I would also highly recommend is, I don't remember what I, what I did, well, shovel snow two days ago, but, <laughs> but, but generally speaking, you know, I don't remember what's happened in the past. So I think when people get these letters, open them up, keep them in a file, and understand one critical thing, that this is an adversarial relationship you and the bank or whoever is holding your mortgage is having. You want to be nice to them, they may be nice to you, but it's clearly an adversarial relationship, so you have to treat it that way. So when you're on the phone talking with them, uh, what I would highly recommend is when you get off the phone, you uh, write down when you called them, who you spoke with, what was the gist of the conversation, and what decisions might have been made, and what the next step was. And if you develop that over the course of several months, six months, even a year, it's just going to make things so much easier when you go to seek help from whatever agency you're going to go to, because then you can bring that all with you, they can go through it, and they can decide what options you have. That's if you right. don't bring that mm -hmm. with you, if you don't do it, uh, it's going to be virtually impossible to recreate what took place during those six months or a year. So create a log, that's very interesting. Very, very much so. If, if there's a timeline established, I can figure out very quickly where we are in the process and how critical the action uh, is, in how, how emergent it is. I, I want to add one other thing, because we're talking about the Attorney General's office and predators out there and so forth. We have to remember that these are just banks. They're in business. They've loaned money. They expect to get money back with a margin, that's how they earn their money. So this, it's not, they're not being bad. Sometimes they're bad in the way they handle it because mm -hmm. they have people that aren't necessarily user friendly. Um, but for the most part, it's simply a business deal for them. They want their money. They have, whether, you know, if it's a credit union, they've got members that they have to account to. If it's a different kind of a bank, they have shareholders who they have to account to. Why have you lost money on these loans? So they're kind of called on the carpet, too. So they're under pressure from an institutional standpoint. You're under pressure. And, and more to your point about keeping the, the documents, you know, it, it's the rare person out there that can get these notices and understand exactly what it means because there's so much requirement, so much regulation in there, gobbledygook that's got to be added in there. And it really, in the effort to make it more informational, it couldn't be less informative because there's just so much attached to it. You know, this is a great discussion. I'm going to get to Bill in one second because I'm going to talk about uh, how we got to this point. But just touching upon what you said about there being laws in place to protect veterans, Mike, what services or what support can your office give uh, if a veteran is, is going through this type of situation and seeing the dominoes start to fall, go in the wrong direction. Sure. Mark brought up an important point, and that is that uh, a service member deployed, um, their, their home cannot be foreclosed on. Um, but that doesn't mean when they return that they can't. Mm. So that's where it is up to that individual to, uh, uh, one, stay on top of things, two, if they can't, make someone aware so that early intervention can happen. And in, in the case of a veteran, um, you know, part of that awareness is talk to the financial institution about, you know, if they can't keep up with the particular payments that are required, let's talk about a, a plan that, that can work and document. Mm -hmm. um, in, if it's beyond that, um, I want to be aware. I want someone to notify me that, you know, I am a veteran, uh, here's my discharge paper, and I need help. And, and there, are, there, there is help. Um, you know, at the, at the state level, um, under the Chapter 115 program, there is okay. financial assistance. And the intention of that program is to keep someone in their home, whether it be an apartment or a, a home that they own, uh, to keep them fed and clothed. Um, 
basic um, you know, financial requirements. Now someone has to financially qualify. They can't just you know, come in and say, I bought a car, now I can't make my right, own payments. Right. So they're, you know, we're talking about uh, you know, near poverty level um, for that program. But when somebody is out disabled, you know, lost one of their income earners, and uh, you know, th that is, you know, when you look at uh, what, they, what they owe and what they have, you know, that, that's a difficult situation. Um, no. And you had, you had mentioned that the first step, though, is to reach out and communicate. You want to know about it. So you as a veterans agent, you would say, I need to know. Somebody needs to tell me, tell you, this is a situation. I need help. It's right. reaching out and making that first initial step. Right. And I do, uh, echoing some of what I've heard here, I do want to know that, that what that person has done for themselves. Um, you know, what have they done as far as reaching other assets, reaching out to the, the, you know, the mortgage holder, you know, what have they done, and now where can I come in and help and bring in other resources? Now, um, well, with that, uh, let's talk about, going back to Julie and John, and specifically, where did this go and build, uh, you know, perhaps you're best uh, able to speak to this. You knew John from elementary school? Well, um, I'd like to begin with, um, you know, it was just a, Typical Friday for me, and uh, I always pick up the Fox Reporter. And I because of your favorite columnist? Well, uh, absolutely, uh, <laughs> and you do look very much like the picture in the paper. <laughs> it's not a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and you know, I'm going through the paper, and then all of a sudden, I saw the article about John, and the pictures that Frank Mortimer put in there were incredibly moving. Um, and then I was reading about uh, Charles and what he had done, and. It's very easy for me, and I think for many of us, when we read about distressing things in the news, to <laughs> you know, you go on to the next page. It's you know, it's just overwhelming. But there was something special about this. Um, in my neighborhood, a uh, a young family who uh, had lived uh, close by for probably I'm guessing maybe 16 years. Uh, their house was foreclosed on, and uh, two kids, and uh, that house now has been vacant for two years. Mm. And I think one of the distressing things was uh, after they were forced out of their home uh, to see a company come in and empty the home, just throw their furniture out on the lawn. Uh, it made no difference. And then, you know, take whatever things were good and, you know, then a dumpster. It, it, it just troubled me to see that. And then, you know, being uh, in town you know, most of my life, uh, my parents moved out here in 56. I went through, uh, I went through 12 years of school with uh, John. Uh, he wasn't uh, a close friend, but uh, you know the people in your mm -hmm. class. And another, another thing that hit home was uh, my wife had uh, come down with breast cancer in early 2010. And, um, you know, eight trips of chemotherapy, uh, seven weeks of radiation, the bills were over $300,000. I very easily could have been John's story. Uh, I know that. Unfortunately for us, my wife had taken out cancer insurance a year before she got cancer, uh, which helped us. I mean, I am a two-income family. I could not have paid my bills uh, if, um, if we hadn't had that insurance. So uh, I'm, I use Facebook a lot. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of kids. They're all over the place, and I publish a lot of history, and I use Facebook for that. So I said to myself, uh, and also, this is also the year that uh, my class of 68 is celebrating its 40, 50th anniversary. I knew I could reach out to my classmates and tell them the story of John. And I was uh, going up to pick up some Chinese food, and I'm sitting in the, in the parking lot. And I don't want to make this a, a faith story, but I am a man of faith. And I know that uh, when, when you hit bottom and you pray, God hears you, whoever your God is. And... Uh, I was a little nervous about taking the lead on something like this, but I, I asked, help me with this, something I want to do. And I went home and I first notified my uh, 500 Facebook friends that I was going to create a website uh, to help this person. Now, many of them don't know John. Mm -hmm. um, they follow me because of my history and things like that. And then the next day, my daughter uh, taught me how to make a Facebook group page for John. Uh, and within, I would say, within 48 hours, over 1,000 people had joined. Uh, right now, there's 1,186 people following wow. this story. Wow. And, um, and, and, and my class uh, of 68 uh, have been incredibly uh, helpful. 
And I have a, and I'm a recruiter. You know, I recruit volunteers. I manage 1,500 volunteers for the Department of Corrections, and, and I have a good way of helping people to find out what it is they want to do. And so what I did was I, uh, I, I cropped a lot of Frank's pictures. I um, discovered a lot of pictures I had of my class and began to put pictures out there of John in first, second grade. Mm -hmm. uh, and then people in the neighborhood started sending me pictures when he was in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. Uh, pictures of the neighborhood. What could happen to a neighborhood when 11 acres of land becomes uh, a bank owns that? Uh, so then there were people just were becoming incredibly interested. And I think a lot of my classmates remembered what it was like growing up in Foxboro. Um, you know, Foxboro has changed a lot, but living throughout this community are townies who have been around a long time, and uh, well, it, this was not going to happen. Right. And, you know, I think that's one of the, one of the special things about Foxboro is that we are a community, and there are uh, new people that come to town, and, uh, you know, with Interstate Highway and, and jobs everywhere, you know, you do have a certain portion that is, um, you know, I won't say transit, but, you know, come into town brand new. But I think the key piece of this is that there is a sense of community. We have a strong discretionary fund. Bill and Donna have been friends of Foxborough Cable Access uh, since, uh, since the beginning of the, of the company here. We have uh, a strong sense of who we are. We call ourselves a gym in Norfolk County, and I introduce each program uh, talking about the people, events, and organizations that make us special, make us the uh, gym in Norfolk County. And I think that this... Uh, uh, I won't call it a project, but this, this mission uh, by Charles and Bill uh, is truly a, a project of community proportion where it is something that is the right thing to do. And to put a face on it, the Foxborough Reporter, and I also pick it up, even on the weeks I'm not in uh, the Fox Report, I do pick it up. Uh, there was another one that just appeared this past week, uh, an article by Frank Mortimer talking about developer drives up local foreclosures. While property foreclosures decreased last year in Massachusetts, completed foreclosure sales in Foxborough jumped from 10 in 2011 to 39 last year, according to town records. One businessman uh, was responsible for 20 of those, but doing simple math, that means 19 properties in Foxborough, homes, family homes uh, or businesses, were foreclosed upon. That's a staggering number considering yeah. the size of our community. And we're considered affluent. We're considered uh, a well-off suburb. People talk about, oh, Foxborough can't afford to live there. Well, Foxborough is a community just as any other community. And it's a real issue, and it's hitting home. So Charles, uh, what, how did this happen to good people? Bad things happen to good people. Some of us are blessed to take out insurance in a timely way. Some well, of us carry certain things, but aneurysms, think, strokes, think, these things will yeah, happen. I think that's exactly it, uh, that uh, Bob, that things do happen that we don't expect will happen, and we're all subject to illness, we're all subject to job loss, and you know, if we're living sort of like paycheck to paycheck, it doesn't take much for the apple cart to get really upset. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, even if you cut back a little bit, that can make the difference where you know, the credit cards start to pile up and the mortgage starts to be, uh, uh, well, I can't make it this month, I'll get it next month, and before you know it, you're, you're many months behind. I think that's the, uh, a key thing in, in, in what happened with John and Julie is, you know, it, it's like it's happening to you and, and it's kind of like, well, I'll keep it to myself, we're all kind of private people, yep. but it's really important to realize that you're not alone, that this is happening in Foxborough, it's happening through Norfolk County, it's happening throughout the entire country. And so you're not alone, and there are places out there for help, and I think that's the key thing is to, before it gets, as Mark was saying, it's much easier to solve the problem and come up with viable solutions that will benefit the homeowner and the bank. The, ease, the further into the process you go, the more difficult it's going to be. And with, in Foxborough, we of course have a human services department, and that could also be a first step. If folks are in a situation where they're at a loss of where to go, uh, attorneys, and they don't have a private attorney, reach out to the town social worker. Vicki Lowe uh, is the executive director of the Senior Services and Human Services, which are a combined organization here in town, for those of you who don't know. Uh, and their telephone number here in town is 543 one two five two and they're located at the senior center uh, here on central street right across the street from foxborough cable access studios just about they are able to along with noreen sheriff's the uh our social worker uh support and if there's a situation where uh one is at a crossroads or doesn't know what to do that might be a very good first step 
I think it's vitally important to also understand the dynamics of the situation, and, and that is, yes, you should contact the bank yourself and have that communication open, but people are not very good advocates on their own, uh, on their own behalf because mm -hmm. there's an emotional element that most people are, all people are not very well equipped to handle. I have in, in my client list many, many lawyers that I represent because they understand sometimes after trying to do it themselves and messing it up that they actually have to have somebody who's just looking out for the business aspect and, and allowing that emotional bar barrier to be in there because as I said earlier, the banks, this is just a business deal for them and, and it, it has to have a business solution and you can't let emotion drive. Now emotion can play a part because there are politics in, in all of this. Um, but somebody has to have an eye out just for the business side of it because there has to be a business solution. And uh, to quote a bad commercial, uh, if banks have attorneys working hard on their behalf. True. You're underserved if you don't hire a professional or, or at least contact a professional to see what your options are. Well, and, and a lot of people think that they can't, well, I can't afford my mortgage. How can I afford to pay a lawyer? Well, if, if you're able to save your home, Keep in mind that if you're already in financial distress, the like, if you lose that home, the likelihood of you buy, being able to buy another one is pretty remote, mm -hmm. at least in the near future. So I think people should work very, very hard to try to save what they have because there are solutions out there because the likelihood is once they're out, it's very difficult to find your way back in. Could, could I add a comment on that, what Absolutely. Mark just said? <clears throat> and that's when somebody loses their home, somebody told me this and I didn't really look at it this way, but they, they said that when you lose your home through foreclosure, it can have a generational impact. And I think that person was absolutely right because perhaps if you have a home, maybe that's going to be the equity that you use to send the kids to college. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's going to be retirement, that type of thing. But once that house is gone, you know, it can affect you, it can affect your children, it can affect your grandchildren. But now in terms of, of where you can get some help, I think the Human Services is a great place. They were very helpful in allowing us to use the friends of the uh, uh, Foxborough Seniors. Sure. And uh, I just walked in, I talked about it for five or ten minutes, and, and they said, sure, we can help. Out. So I think that's the type of spirit there is in, in, uh, in government here in, in Foxborough. But there's some other places like uh, in the Attorney General's office. I think this is an important, uh, these are specialists and it's called the Home Core Loan Modification Initiative and okay. it's, there's a Home Core hotline and what they do is you just call, it's 617-573-5333. And it's, you, you can call in, you can tell them what the problem is. They're specialists in this. There is a new law in Massachusetts that was passed in August, uh, basically to give uh, homeowners some foreclosure protection where the banks, they have to uh, go through a process where it's the value of the, of the loan modification has to be, uh, if it's greater than the net recovery from the foreclosure mm -hmm. sale, they have to go through a, this loan modification process. So what this can do is it can give the homeowner some leverage, but again, they have to keep track of, of the paper trail and, and the conversations. But that, that new law that went into effect in November of last year, that can give the homeowner some leverage uh, to try to work something out with the bank. Because generally speaking, if the bank uh, if you can modify the loan where the people will stay in the home and, and still make the mortgage payments, it's a win-win for the homeowner and for the bank. Mm. Um, there's another, uh, if some people feel that if they can't afford a lawyer, and this might depend on income obviously, the, for Foxborough, we have the Metro West Legal Services out in Framingham, and that's a source that uh, people could contact to see if they qualify for their services. And let me just give you their number there. Please. It's 1-800-696. 1501. And there was another source in working with John and Julie that could, could be quite helpful. And this is called Hopeline. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this mm -hmm. is the Attorney General's office and Senator Warren's office, both focused on this, this source. It's Hopeline, not Helpline. And it's 1 888 995 Hope or 4673. So that's Hopeline. And, and basically that's a nonprofit and they do housing counseling so they could, uh, again, they're experts. And that's what, as, as Mark said, this stuff is so technical and so complicated. You really need someone who has some expertise in this to, to help you through the process and tell you what your options are. Hmm. That's very good information. And what I'm gonna do is, uh, we, the time just flies when you're having this type of discussion. Thank you so much to all my guests for uh, appearing today. I'm gonna go next to Bill and we're gonna talk about 
the Facebook page, LinkedIn, how, how you access this uh, super group that you've put together. But before we do that, just to note, Fox Sports Cable Access is online at www.fcatv.org. If you have your pen and paper and you think you've missed it, you haven't missed it. You can log on to our website at www.fcatv.org. Go to the link for other videos, Foxborough Central. We've got a huge presence, and uh, this program, I hope, will be considered a resource. And that's really what this is about. It's to raise funds or help promote the message uh, that John and Julie are in a situation where they need help. But it's also education for the rest of this community. And perhaps these resources that you just shared with us, Charles, will be uh, ones that people will be able to take advantage to so we don't have to have this type of a conversation again. Bill. Well, you mentioned all these great things, I will admit, <laughs> uh, and I think I'm a little younger than you are, but I'm not much more Facebook savvy than you are. I don't yeah. even have a presence. Talk to us. Well, um, in the case of, um, well, Facebook can be used for many different things, and uh, I wanted to create a page that was specifically for John uh, and Julian, so I, I went to the greatest source, the younger people, and my, my uh, daughter walked me through it in mm -hmm. about five minutes. And if you want to visit the page, which is be really good because it'll be an archival record, really, of how this transpires. Uh, basically, you just do a search for Save John and Julian uh, Hazeldine from Foreclosure. That's the name of the page. Save and it, John and Julian from Foreclosure. Correct. And that will, if you do that on Facebook, it'll bring you right to it. If you just type in John Hazeldine, uh, you'll find the page eventually, okay. if you're on Facebook. But that's, if you're on Facebook, that's the easiest way. And it's an archival record of photographs and, and comments of, uh, of, of how people uh, just reached out. And uh, one of the uh, things I found very interesting was um, if I just happened to be reading the Sun Chronicle on Friday, and there was a letter to the, edit uh, the, letter to the editor from uh, a gentleman who's an editor from the, uh, out in the Berkshires, mm -hmm. uh, who they happened to print the Foxborough Reporter. Uh, so, and his letter was just unbelievable because he had read the editorial, and um, it was the, um, something, the eagle out there, the, Pitts, the Pittsfield eagle, uh, so that people are, this thing is beginning, I don't say it's going viral, mm -hmm. but uh, it's getting more and more attention, and um, it, it's a great way to get the word out there about anything. I mean, uh, I find Facebook uh, uh, for keeping track of my children and, and publishing history and things like that, but it's also great for a cause, and, um, that's, what, that's basically how it happened. Well, again, and my appreciation uh, to John and Julie for uh, allowing us to share this because, as you say, a cause can only start with communication and learning about. And maybe this will springboard into a greater awareness and will, even if it just touches one person somewhere, to say, hey, I need to take action now and not wait until it becomes a tragic situation. That's a good thing. So I want to thank everybody for coming out. Mike, with veterans, being uh, so much in the news for the bad things that happen, what is the first step for a veteran that, uh, if they're facing a situation such as this, where uh, either through disability or uh, hard luck, what is the first thing they do? Sure, I, I want to back it up even further than that, and I want to say Please. the first step is not to get yourself up to your neck in in debt. Okay, um, sure, the the VA loans they you know they can get up to four hundred nineteen thousand. Uh, dollars uh, maximum, but you got to look at your income and you know not don't trust um, you know the other sources to say well this is what you can afford. You've got to look at what your, your income source is because we do get sick, we do have injuries, things happen. So let's not take it into hock to the maximum. Next step is uh, like it's, I had mentioned, communicate, communicate with your you know the, the lender and make a good faith effort. And then it's reach out to some of these sources as folks around the table here have mentioned. There are resources out there. Don't, don't go it alone. Uh, reach out, find out where the help is, and accept help. Um, I, I will say that um, this has been a fantastic effort as I've watched it. Um, and my family has, has con contributed a little bit in, into this greater um, you know, uh, uh, fundraising effort that's going on. But I will say that, uh, you know, in, in these hard financial times, um, going down the road, um, you know, a couple of more people get into this sort of a situation. How many times can the community come together and do it? Mm -hmm. This community does a great job of doing it, coming together like that. 
but I think people need to take some precautionary steps. And that's not to say that, uh, that the Hazeldines have gone wrong at any point, but moving down the line, I think people need to, uh, to watch what, what can they handle, reach out for help, and um, you know, um, accept that help. You know, and, and that is an excellent point because in speaking with folks at the food pantry uh, in preparation for this program, uh, their message was uh, very clear, you know, we're able to assist before it becomes a, a tipping point. And uh, with Foxbury Human Services, uh, and that social worker is your primary contact to uh, access what Foxborough has to offer. But when it comes to this situation, we're way beyond that step. And so um, awareness of the different pieces that have to fall into place till we get to this point. And you're right, it's not feasible to have a, a fundraiser you know, for every person. And it's unfortunate because it would be a great thing to be able to altruistically say, yes, this is something we're gonna do for everybody, but it's not. It does come down to responsibility and taking a proactive uh, measure. So Mark. Yeah, per personal responsibility, I just think, in the larger perspective is, is vitally important. And that's a lesson I think people have to learn. A lot of people are learning. However, it's also a really huge piece when you're negotiating with the bank. If you've shown that you're responsible, that you're acting in good faith, and you're doing everything that you can do, mm -hmm. instead of at the last minute throwing your hands up and saying, oh my God, I, I, I don't know what to do, they don't handle that very well. Right. Uh, it's, it's negotiation, it's positioning, it's reality. You have to take all of the right steps, and, and people shouldn't be afraid to call a lawyer or call one of these agencies. It's not about pride, it's not about, you know, people call me about all kinds of things all the time, and it's, it stays in that conversation. It doesn't go anywhere else. I, I highly recommend people contact someone that they trust or think they can trust and get helpful advice. Because if somebody calls me, I can tell them very quickly how much trouble they're in. They may not even realize it. And then map, very easily map out a plan. Okay, here's what can be done. Here's what you should do. And, and sometimes the advice is not what they want to hear, but I don't get paid to give the happy advice all the right. time. It's the, it's the reality. You know, people know, well, so sometimes people need to truly understand. So when somebody leaves my office in particular, after discussing an, discussing an issue, is, I tell them, look, sleep easy. Take a deep breath. I'll tell you when it gets really bad. And, and I'm not going to lie. I'll, you know, sometimes it gets really bad, and you have to you have to tell people, look, it, this is just not going to happen. But more times than not, there's a, I mean, a high percentage of uh, occasions there is a solution. But you're just bringing it back to to our, the scenario that was the impetus for this, before foreclosure is way better than trying to do something post foreclosure mm -hmm. because it's a whole different dynamic. And, and as these folks are finding out, it's it's way more difficult. And, you would, and thank you so much, and Charles, you had mentioned about Metro West Legal Services. Uh, there are other resources online. Uh, some of them are linked through our town uh, website. You can easily uh, go to the town of Foxboro uh, town website, go to the social services link, the Department of Social Services and Senior Services. Uh, and, and one of the great resources is a nonprofit organization called MassResources.org, and it too will also detail many of the um, legal opportunities, responsibilities, programs available to support uh, a variety of issues. Um, and that address is www.massresources.org. Um, so there's many resources available, but let's bring it back home for the last word, Charles. And, With and, Julian and John, a tragic situation where hard work continued to happen, a disabling stroke, left them unable to work. What's the next step now? Um, I think the next step is we have to see if the, the deadline was February 13th, at which point the direct federal uh, said they would not go forward with the eviction. So uh, I'm going to call the Attorney General's office up today to see if that, I'm, if that uh, deadline has been extended. Hopefully it has been into the future, and, and then we'll get it onto, onto Bill's website so everybody knows. And, and you know, ho I think, again, as, uh, as we've said during the discussion, um, if people get together, the banks and the homeowners and other people, it can be a win-win for everybody. So that's hopefully where it's, this is going to go. I know that John and Julie, they've applied to uh, 
uh, for it uh, along with Boston Community Capital. Uh, and uh, that was done last week, so that's about a six-week process. So that's ongoing. So, uh, and the, the more money we can raise, uh, the better it's going to be for them that they'll qualify for the loan. So uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. And uh, we're th three weeks ago, I, I thought we, everybody was in big trouble. But it's just the outpouring from the community and, and the help that everybody's been giving them. It's just, uh, it, it just shows what a great community Foxborough and the surrounding towns are. May I join in one final word with you? You get two? the absolute last okay. word. <laughs> the reason, because I don't, uh, mock Mission Pride, and I don't want us to, I don't want our, our viewers, I don't want us to leave here thinking that it's all about money. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, I, I, I saw in the pictures of John that he couldn't smile. And to me, this is about quality of life, too, and being able to smile. And I had started all this without asking John's permission. So three days into it, I said, I've, I've got to do something. I have to ask John's permission. And I said, as I was having the conversation with John, I said, John, I've started this Facebook page. I says, may I continue with this? And he says, well, of course, it's Bill. I have no pride anymore. Uh, anything you can do to help me? And I said, you know, John, I just want you to smile again. And he said to me, I want to be able to smile again. So it isn't all about money. It's about how you, you know. It's about how you. It affects your relationship in a marriage. It affects your children. It affects everything. So it isn't just all about money. It's about people's quality of life. And Foxborough is a wonderful town uh, that uh, encourages a good quality of life. And I would like to see that to continue. That's great. And what is the Facebook page? One more time. Uh, just uh, save John and Julian from eviction. This is a real-time program. This is the week of the tipping point. Let's see if we can't show some community pride and make it so that way uh, we, as a community, can say we made a difference, we saved uh, a home, and make some people smile. This is Bob Hickey. Thank you very much for taking the time to sit with us, my panel. Thank you so much to Charles DePompo, uh, Mark Stopa, Mike Johns, Bill Milholm. Thank you to all the volunteers who made this program possible. And thank you also to John and Julianne Hazeldine for allowing us to share their story. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, but at the same time, it's very important that we as a community come together and understand the situation, how we got here, and how we can prevent it from happening again, in addition to raising funds. If you at home, and this is the week, uh, would like to make a donation to the John and Julianne Hazeldine um, cause, uh, please make your checks payable to um, the uh, Friends of Foxborough Seniors and send that to P.O. Box 116 here in Foxborough, 02035. Make a note on it. It's for the John and Ju Julian Hazeldine uh, Fund and know that you're doing something special. On behalf of everybody here at Foxborough Cable Access, Betty Travers behind the camera, Deb Storrs behind the other camera, Gary Nash behind the glass, Mike Weber, our executive director. I'm Bob Hickey. Please Go to www.fcatv.org. You can see, replay this, and get all those important numbers and organizations that are out there to help you, a potentially distressed homeowner or someone who knows someone who could use some help. www.fcatv.org, or contact us here at our 28th Central Street offices at 508-543-4757 to get a transcript, to get a DVD, or to get more information. On behalf of all my panelists, thank you so much for taking the time. Have a great day, Foxborough.